Hey friend, welcome back to Getting Started with Amazon Relational Database Service. Now to kind of kick things off in this first video, let's make sure that we position RDS uh, in the right light. We want to understand what the major value proposition behind RDS and why that makes a big deal to us as customers and recognizing some of that classic shared responsibility model when it comes down to security, management, and uh, some of the responsibilities around keeping these important systems up and running. And so kind of starting right off, uh, when I start this conversation, I think about why RDS is helpful. It helps to recognize that for a lot of applications, okay, let's call this a system, a generic system. <laughs> there's always a couple of different components that work there. You have logic, okay? And typically the logic is coming from the applications itself. So you're thinking about software developers, um, writing and maintaining logic that control what they do with the other required element that we have in here. And that would be the data itself. Okay. And we recognize that the data comes from some sort of a storage system, whether that be locally on a hard drive, on a file system, somewhere there in the operating system. And you keep in mind that we can talk about the, <laughs> the operating system, the OS underneath of this, a critical kind of necessary evil in this puzzle. And we recognize that in order for these apps to use the storage layers underneath of it, there are a thousand different variations that we've tackled with this basic model over the years. And so when we ask ourselves, why do we care about the relational database service? What's the difference? One of the first fundamental best practices that we're trying to encourage by using a system like RDS is the principle of separation of duty. We are saying that in the grand scheme of compute power, some systems are going to be much better tailored to perform specific parts of this layer rather than trying to do all of them at once. Imagine yourself in a food truck, you have to take the orders, you have to cook the food, you have to serve it and put it on the plates and get it back out to the customers all by yourself. At some point, the capacity is going to become a problem for you and you won't be able to handle all those tasks as effectively. And so one of the big principles here we see is the idea of separation of duties where we could say, well, why don't we have a different system? Okay, and we'll go ahead and just call that a database over here for now for argument's sake, handle the storage of the data for us. Now, what this does in itself is recognizing that what the app does to provide logic and what the database does to store the information, they're fundamentally different parts of the task, but they're very closely integrated together. And so in order for a database to help us in some way, we have to have some predictability and we have to have some reasonable expectations around being able to access that data and work with it on a regular basis. Now, the funny thing is here, friends, that a lot of the storage logic that comes from databases it isn't driven by the logic of the app itself. It's kind of more of a basic rule that says, if I put this label on it and you put it there, I want to be able to come back and get it using that same label, and I'm talking very generically here, and have you go and retrieve that data for me. As long as this contract between the app and the storage layer is valid and they know how to interact with it, there is a lot of value in separating the duties and it stands to reason that if I can take the database and let somebody else manage it for me, that increases the overall value proposition uh, in a number of big ways. And so what we're saying is that by having AWS manage the database for me, it allows me not only to focus on the logic of the application, this is the part that really provides, you know, the business brains, the part that actually solves problems for the organization. It allows my developers and my operations folks to focus on the things that really make a difference. We call that the differentiating part of an application or a solution. And I know some of this is kind of some nebulous terminology here, but remember friends, in order to understand how these systems work and why they're valuable to us, especially as an architect, we need to understand some of the underlying limitations that these old models create create single monolithic systems like a like the one I've drawn on the left here <laughs> those had a lot of limitations moving into a managed database model allows us to free ourselves up and put our efforts elsewhere so I'm going to go ahead and clean this up here now that we know a little bit about that what exactly is AWS doing for us well Amazon is able to using the RDS service take a really significant burden of that administration directly off of Bart's shoulders Ooh, oh man that feels a lot better and what I'm talking about would be like the ability to manage and build all the infrastructure. So in the background, RDS is a managed database service that runs on EC2. Okay, so we recognize that it runs on EC2. And friends, we don't have time to talk about EC2 in its entirety today, but recognize that as a virtual machine infrastructure service from AWS. So they are running the virtual machines for you in the background and they're handling the physical infrastructure. Take a look somewhere else in the catalog and look up the shared responsibility model and you can get a better breakdown on how infrastructure, platform, and software as a service cloud models uh, shift some of those responsibilities. 
So Amazon's building the instances for us. They're also running the networks that we design and operate in the background. And they're also providing a lot of the maintenance parts of it. This means that if a virtual machine crashes, Amazon's gonna know about it because they're also handling the monitoring and they can bring those machines back online. So all of this heavy integration with the infrastructure parts of it releases one of the first big kind of heavy lifts for me as an administrator or as a developer, as an operations person. Beyond that, it goes even further. When we look at the software that's running on these virtual machines, if you've never installed a database before, it's a good chance maybe go out there and try that on your own there. Look up some good tutorials on maybe running a LAMP stack on Linux where you would run MariahDB or MySQL on it. It's good to run the software and then configure the connections so you can get an appreciation for what Amazon's doing in the background. For me, I've been doing this a long time and having them install the software and then tell me when there's a new software release available and then offering me the ability to have them just go and patch it for me, that again, lifts in another big section of focus for me and my workload day to day off my shoulders and allows me to keep focusing on what we use the database for and a whole lot less on administering it. One thing to kind of keep in mind here, friends, RDS is not a new service. This product has been in AWS's catalog for a long time. So it's evolved quite a bit over the years. And all of this is due to the very powerful options that are available at having Amazon run the database for you. So we like it so far. It's a pretty good sales pitch. Along those lines, once you have a precious system up and running, maintaining its state and its viability is a key part of information security. And of course, the performance and operation side of running an application. So having RDS perform backups for you. This is a big win. Amazon is now taking regular snapshots of the, the underlying storage volumes for the database itself and then storing it for me and rotating through the backups. Again, another thing I don't have to worry about. Another thing I don't have to worry about. A third thing I don't have to worry about now. I can simply give AWS some of my operation expectations and have them execute against them. All of which we'll be talking a lot more about as we move through the lessons. Moving on, when it comes down to security, we all care about security. That doesn't mean that I care about doing the individual administrative layer parts of it all the way myself. If I can give AWS some quality expectations and have them execute against that, that's a pretty big win for me. So the authentication, the traffic filtering as it moves from the network to the connector into the database, and then some of the encryption options that are available there as well can now all be set as an expectation when I launch the database and have Amazon execute against that. And this uh, deals with a large number of layers. First of all, kind of keep in mind too, like we said that these do run on EC2 instances in the background, but in the underlying storage layer, they are using EBS Elastic Block Store volumes. Okay, so there's my little volume. And by telling AWS that you want the database encrypted, simple little flag that says encrypted, they are actually going to go through and handle the application of that encryption logic onto the storage layer itself. And again, this is super abstracted for me. In fact, you won't even see the EBS volume show directly up in your AWS account because they are managing them for you transparently in the background. On top of that, if you're using something like Microsoft SQL, uh, see, there we go. <laughs> and you want to leverage something like transparent data encryption, which is a row level data level encryption service. Those features that are really software features, they're still supported through RDS. So you can use that very granular level of encryption simply by allowing the database engines to do what they do best in the background. So very important to recognize friends, we're talking about a value add from AWS in the management layer while still allowing you to leverage all of the fantastic software features. Okay, most of the fantastic software features of these modern databases. Beyond that, we also recognize that Amazon offers a variety of durability options too. So when it comes down to having multiple copies of the database, handling failovers, or maybe you have reporting requirements where you need to have replicas, copies of that database made available uh, for reporting or analytic purposes, RDS again simplifies a lot of those options by abstracting the management of it and keeping in mind that since AWS is responsible for all these pieces, <laughs> so all of these components that are out here, they can simply make copies of them, replicate them, and again, go back to that monitoring state where they are helping provide visibility uh, over the life cycle of those elements as well. So this leaves me as a customer with a very small list of things that I have to worry about. Indeed, I can largely just focus on what engine do I want to use? Do I want uh, Mariah, Postgres, MySQL? Do I want to use Oracle, Microsoft uh, SQL? I can pick those engines. I can choose the deployment quality aspects, like you heard me saying, such as how often the backups run, the availability and the security features, and Amazon will execute against those for me. And then simply just start connecting and using the database in the background. 
Keeping in mind that I do have this other option on here, this one about security options. When it comes down to authentication, okay, and authorization, there are still some layers that we have to get involved with. But for a lot of us, those are really the most important pieces. We care that this app can write to this table in the database, or we care that this group of administrators has the ability to change properties of the database. So there is still some shared responsibility that gets a little more granular there. Uh, but keep in mind, if you're using products like Amazon Aurora, which we'll talk about later on, the authentication and authorization layer can actually be integrated into identity and access management within the AWS uh, authentication realm already. So there are some nice helpers depending on which version of the engines you're using in the background all of which we'll be trying to help you characterize uh, coming forward in the next couple of lessons. And so just to kind of recap your friends, when we start thinking about the relational database service from Amazon, it's all about managed databases. We're using classic database engines that lots of applications use in the past and are continuing to use in the future, but we're allowing Amazon to manage a large portion of those componentry in the background. This includes building the EC2 instances that the databases run on, maintaining that infrastructure and the network presence and the traffic filtering, again, with our rules established on top of it, and then also pairing it up with the software management practices that are available too. The installation of it, the management of patching and updating, and also the ability for us to uh, kind of augment what that major or minor release process might look like. Keeping in mind, friends, we're not just talking about one single database instance. You might have hundreds to thousands of database servers in your environment, and all of these little bits of effort that are removed from your shoulder, when they get compounded, it turns into a really big value proposition for everybody. So all across the board, we recognize that organizations should be embracing an opportunity to remove the database from classic monolithic applications, and then furthermore, consider the value of having Amazon manage those databases for you. The last piece we discussed were some of the service offerings that are available. By telling Amazon what your security expectations are, they can help you with some of the authorization, authentication, encryption, and some of those other traffic filtering aspects that you heard me talking about earlier. Finally, when it comes down to deployment options, Amazon has a variety of data center deployment scenarios Again, driven by virtual private clouds and EC2 that allow us to control where our database instances are running and directly affects the availability and durability of the underlying data store systems themselves. Pair that up with replication options and odds are you should be able to find something that will immediately improve the durability, quality and reliability of your applications data stores right now and definitely in the future. And so now that we understand a little bit more about what RDS is and how it fits into the portfolio, in the next lesson, we'll talk a little bit more about why we care about relational databases in the first place. Because from an architecture perspective, knowing when to use it and when not to use it is often exactly the crux of the biscuit. So stick with me, friends, and I'll see you there.